Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Devedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and in this module we are discussing about the different types of cells. So in today's class we are going to start discussing about this particular cell and how the cell is actually functioning the different types of uh, you know uh, task and how what are the different organelles are present within the cell and what is the structure of the cell. So when we talk about the cell. So uh, as you can see that the higher eukaryotes uh, have multiple organs to perform the specific functions right such as liver, kidney and heart whereas in the uh, and these organs have the specific tissue and each tissue is composed of the cells right. So uh, whatever is function what is happening in a in a higher organisms like the humans that it has the different types of organs like with suppose for example we have the liver we have the kidney we have heart we have the lungs and all these organs have their specialized functions but these organs are also made up of, of tissues and that tissues are made up of, of the cell so function whatever we function we say is actually being performed by the cell what is present in that particular organ and that's why the cell is considered to be the structural as well as the functional unit of the cell so whatever the function you see from that particular organ could be performed by that particular cell as well which means a cell is the smallest unit which actually be able to perform all the functions for example in a human body we have different types of organs to perform the different types of tasks like uh, you know heart is there for circulating the blood uh, liver is there for detoxification kidney is there for the excretion of the byproducts lung is there for uh, you know respirations but the cell which is actually the structural and functional unit can be able to perform all these function on its own because it has all the necessary infrastructure to perform all the functions based on the cellular structures cells are classified either as the prokaryotic cell or the eukaryotic cell so what you see here is a prokaryotic cell which is actually a bacterial cell and the, I, am, I have taken the two example of the eukaryotic cell I have taken the, uh, the example of the plant cell and I have taken an example of the animal cell so based on the structure and uh, structure cellular structure the cells are classified into the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic cell in most of the cases prokaryotic cells are the single cell whereas the eukaryotes are either single or the part of the multicellular tissue system. So before getting into the detail of the structure of the prokaryotic or the eukaryotic cells, let us discuss about the differences between the prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic cell so that you will be understand what could be the differences what is going to happen and how the, uh, the eukaryotic cell has you know evolved from the prokaryotic cell. So what you see here is a, a table where I have listed the differences. So this is the, uh, the, the, the properties of the prokaryotic cell and this is the property of the eukaryotic cell. Uh, size, okay. So first criteria is the size and the size is very small. So prokaryotic cells are mostly in the range of the uh, micrometer range whereas the eukaryotic cells the eukaryotic cells could be of variable size uh, they could be uh, uh, you know they could be up to the 40 micrometer in diameter so they could be uh, you know several sizes rbcs macrophages uh, kupfer cells and all those kind of things so they will be very different as far as the genetic material is concerned the genetic material could be uh, that genetic material is circular in the case of the cytosol and it is present as a free material which means it is not present in the uh, it, in the bound form whereas the dna in the form of a linear chromosome present in the well defined double membrane nucleus so no direct connection with the cytosol so, so, so in the eukaryotes the uh, the dna is uh, present in the form of a chromosome and that is present in a well defined structure which is called as the nucleus and that nucleus is not directly under the contact with the cytosol then the replications uh, as for the replication is concerned so replication means uh, how you are actually going to make the another copy of your genome right 
so the replication is done by the single origin of replication what is present in the case of prokaryotes uh, whereas in the case of eukaryotes it is having the multiple origin of replications uh, as far as the genes are concerned so the genes are the uh, the functional unit the genes are the functional uh, part of uh, the genome which are actually be responsible for the production of different types of products or different types of proteins so for the gene uh, there is no intron present whereas in the case of eukaryotes you have a uh, introns are present in the eukaryotes so don't worry about this uh, particular uh, terminologies because these terminologies will be clear when we are going to discuss about the replication transcription and translations in a subsequent uh, modules then the organelles there is no organelle the no membrane bound organelle is present in the prokaryotic system whereas the membrane bound organelles are with the well defined functions are present so you have the different types of organelles you have the nucleus you have the mitochondria you have the chloroplast you have the endoplasmic reticulums and so on so that all we are going to discuss in this particular module then the cell wall there is a definite very complex cell wall what is present in the prokaryotic system whereas in the case of eukaryotes except the fungi and the plant the eukaryotic cells are devoid of a thick cell wall which means the animal cells are devoid of the cell wall whereas the fungi and the plants are going to have the cell wall then the ribosomes so ribosomes are the protein machinery and uh, they are actually going to be 70s so this is a, uh, a kind of a uh, you know parameter so that 70s and uh, the uh, whereas in the case of the eukaryote it is the 80s then we have the transcription and the translation so transcription and translations occurs simultaneously in the case of prokaryotic cell whereas in the case of transcription in the nucleus so transcription is happening within the nucleus and the translation is happening within the cytosol as we said only uh, already in the uh, in the beginning that the uh, nucleus is dna the genome is present in a well defined nucleus and that is very very far away from the cytosol that's why the uh, transcription is uh, and the translation is not happening in the same simultaneously transcription is happening in the nucleus and the translation is happening inside the cytosol uh, the, so before so now let's start about the discussion about the prokaryotic cells so the simple prokaryotic cell what is being shown here right this is a bacterial cell right uh, and the structure of the prokaryotic cell a simple prokaryotic cell is very simple and smaller than the eukaryotic cell as we said you know prokaryotic cells are in the range of micrometer whereas uh, the uh, the eukaryotic cells are very very big uh, compared to the prokaryotic cell uh, one of the classical uh, difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell that it has a well it has no membrane bound organelle including the nucleus so you what you have is a cell where all the organelles are present within this cytosol right and what you have here is the different types of organelle you have the flagella you have the you know genomic dna or the or the genome of the bacteria or the prokaryotic cell then you have the well defined cell wall then you have the plasma membrane and then it has a protective capsule which is actually going to give the strength and protection and then we it has the ribosome which is called as the uh, the protein machinery then it also has the food granules and all other kinds of things and it has the pili then it has the cytoplasm and the plasmids so let's discuss about all these uh, uh, the substructures what is present in the prokaryotic cell so the first uh, substructure is the flagella so flagella is present in the those bacteria which are actually motile so flagella is uh, present in a bacteria and it is required for the motion within the bacteria so you can see that if, if, if a bacteria is present in a drop it actually can use this flagella to swim around so flagella is attached to the bacterial capsule is a central feature of most of the prokaryotic cell especially the motile bacteria it it provides the motion or the locomotion to the bacteria and it is responsible for the chemotaxis of the bacteria i'm sure you probably are not aware of this uh, uh, 
terminology which is called as chemotaxis. What is mean by the chemotaxis? Chemotaxis means the attraction of uh, organism, attraction towards chemicals. Okay. For example, if there is a sugar crystal, right? If there is a sugar crystal, right? Then the, what the bacteria is going to see, right? It is actually going to move towards this sugar crystal because it it is looking for that particular sugar crystal. It wants to eat that, right? So that motion, right? That directed motion of a bacteria towards the particular chemical is known as the chemotaxis and how it will move it is actually going to use this flagellum which is attached to the capsule movement of a bacteria towards a chemical gradient is known as the chemotaxis okay which means once you have a sugar molecule here it is actually going to be dissolved into the water right and it is actually going to have a gradient so because this is uh, bacteria can be able to have the senses, it can be able to sense this particular gradient and that is how it will move towards the uh, that particular food source. It could be glucose, it could be any other molecule as well. So, flagellum is a part of cell wall and its motion is regulated by the motor protein present inside the cell. So, flagellum is attached to the cell wall and inside it ha actually has the motor neurons like just like uh, when in a humans we have the muscles. It simply it has also be attached to the cellular machinery so that it actually can has the motor neuron motor uh, 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 motor proteins and that motor protein actually can change the flipping movement. So it that the flagellum is actually going to have the flipping movement, right? It's actually going to move like that. And the flagellar motion is an energy consuming process and it is governed by the ATPase present at the bottom of that particular shot. It is made up of, of the protein which is called as flagellin and the reduction or the suppression of the flagellar protein reduces the bacterial infectivity and ability to grow. So, some of the bacteria also uses the flagellum even for uh, accessing the different types of host and that is how they can be able to use this for reaching to the host right. So, they can also use for reaching to the host and that is how they can be infectious. So, if you actually reduce the production of this flagellin protein and if somehow you compromise the flagellar movement you are actually going to make the bacteria non-motile and that is how the bacteria is going to lose its ability to infect and that is how they will be not going to cause the disease. Now the second is the bacterial surface layer. So as you can see the bacteria has a very very complex uh, surface layer because bacteria possesses the three anatomical barrier to protect the cells from the extreme external damages. So since the bacteria does not have the uh, membrane bound organelles and uh, it is very susceptible for the hypotonic uh, lysis because bacteria is mostly being present in the water or hypotonic solutions. It has a very well defined anatomical barrier so that it can actually be able to withstand this. So, what are the cap what are the different uh, layers you have? You have a bacterial capsule which is the outermost layer and it is made up of, of the high molecular weight polysaccharide. So, what you see here is this is the bacterial capsule right and this capsule is required because it gives the protections and it, this is the outermost layer and then it is it is impermeable to the water or other aqueous solvent and it is responsible for the antigenicity of the bacterial cell. Then you have the cell wall which is present in the uh, middle layer right and the cell wall and it is responsible for uh, this giving its response to the gram staining and the third is the plasma membrane. So you have the three layer one is the capsule so the outermost layer is capsule then you have the cell wall and then you have the plasma membrane. And why the bacteria has uh, such a complicated system because bacteria is always been present in a harsh environmental condition. It could be present in the water, it could be present in a uh, strong acid solution, it could be present in a alkali solution, it could be present in a solution where lot of chemical toxicants are present. So, because these are things are there, it actually is protecting themselves by using uh, all these layers. So, capsule is a very, very thick layer which actually is not going to allow these chemical to get inside the cell. 
then the we have the cell wall so cell wall a composition in gram negative and gram positive bacteria is different the cell wall has different constituents and be responsible for their reactivity towards the gram stain so we have the two different types of bacteria one is called as the gram positive bacteria and other one is called as the gram negative bacteria and both of these bacteria will have the different types of cellular uh, cell wall compositions and because of that they will be uh, differentially responsible for uh, one of the classical stain which is called as the gram stain and because of the gram stain uh, the gram stain they are being classified either as the gram positive which means the gram positive are actually going to give you the staining uh, whereas uh, they are going to be gram negative if they are not going to be give you the gram uh, staining okay and based on this only the gram staining the bacteria are classified as a gram positive or gram negative so let's see what are the different components are present in a uh, in a cell wall the outermost layer what you have is a peptidoglycan layer peptidoglycan layer so this is the peptidoglycan layer what you see here so the peptidoglycan layer is very thick in the case of the gram positive bacteria so you see the multiple layers are present in the gram positive bacteria whereas it is very thin in the case of the gram negative bacteria and because of this only uh, it is actually having a differential response towards the gram staining. Peptidoglycan is a polymer of the NAG and the NAM. NAG is N-acetyl glucosamine and the NAM is the N-acetyl muramic acid. So NAG and NAM are actually the sugar molecules which are present and these sugar molecules are connected to each other by a peptide by a beta 1,4 linkage and the sugar polymers are attached because you see this it, it has uh, you know sugar molecules right so this, these are the sugar molecules which are being attached to each other by a beta 1 4 linkage and alternatively you have you have the nam block then it is connected to a nag block and then it has a NAM block like that. So you have, you see that it has a one layer, then you have second layer, you have third layer, you have fourth layer and fifth layer. And then these layers are being attached by the peptide chains, which are composed of the amino acid L-alanine, D-glutamic acid, L-lysine and the D-alanine, which means it is actually a combination of the L and the D amino acid. Uh, if you are not very aware, very much uh, aware of the L and the D form, then we are going to discuss that when we are going to talk about the amino acids. But these are the uh, two different types of amino acids. And you know that the L amino acids are more uh, abundant in the nature compared to the D amino acids. So the peptide chain present in one layer cross link to the next layer to form a meshwork which is responsible for the physical strength of the cell. So what you have is you have the NAM and the NAG blocks and then the second layer is also having the same way and then these layers are actually being connected by the peptide chains and these that is how it is actually giving a tensile strength to the cell wall and that is how they are very very uh, you know robust or they are very very rigid in terms of accepting the out, outside molecules. Uh, and the peptidoglycan synthesis is targeted by the antibiotics such as penicillin whereas the lysozymes actually degrades the peptidoglycan layer by cleaving the glycosidic bond connecting the NAG and NAM to form the polymer. So you have the two options if you want to destroy the cell wall. What you have is you can actually have the antibiotics. So if you put the antibiotics, what antibiotics is going to do is it is actually going to uh, uh, it is going to target the peptidoglycan synthesis. One of the classical example is the penicillin. Uh, the other is option is that you can use an enzyme which is called as the lysozyme. And that lysozyme is actually going to degrade the linkage between the NAM and the NAC. Lysozyme is a very, very important enzyme what is present in our tears uh, and as well as the saliva and that is how the tear and the saliva are actually protecting the humans from the bacterial infection because as soon as the bacteria goes uh, irrespective of whether it is a gram positive bacteria or the gram negative bacteria the lysosomes are lysozyme is actually cleaving 
the bond between the NAG and NAG and that's how they are actually uh, destroying the cell wall and once they destroy the cell wall they are these bacteria are very very susceptible for the uh, osmotic uh, damages so they will be very susceptible for the water and or they will be very susceptible for the tear like conditions and that's how they are actually going to get lysed and that's how they will die so this is one of the strategies and that's how people are trying to develop many antibiotics which are actually going to work on the peptidoglycan synthesis Apart from that, the cell wall is also having the lipotechoic acid. So, apart from the peptidoglycan layer, you also have the uh, lipotechoic acid which is present in the cell wall. So, lipotechoic acid are only present in the gram positive bacterial cell wall and it is an important antigenic determinant. Okay. So, that is why the, this, this for lipotechoic acid, our immune system is actually going to work and that is how it is actually going to produce the response. Then we have the lipopolysaccharides or the LPS. The lipopolysaccharides are only be present in the gram negative cell wall and it is important antigenic determinants. So compared to the lipotechoic acid which is only present in the gram positive bacteria, in the gram negative bacteria you have the lipopolysaccharide and that lipopolysaccharide is a very very important antigenic determinant because that is actually going to induce the immune response in the humans. This is I have just given you a write up so that if you are interested you can actually be able to read about the gram staining. So gram staining is a staining which has been uh, you know developed by a, a, a Danish scientist which is called as the Hans Christian Gram and uh, as I said you know gram staining is gram positive bacteria is taking up the gram stain whereas the gram negative bacteria are not taking up the stain. So if you want to mo be more interested about reading the gram staining you can be able to go through with this publication and as well as I have given you a small write up so that you can also go through this particular write up as well. So now let us move on to the uh, beyond the cell wall. So apart from the cell wall you have the, they have the cytosol and the other organelles. So prokaryotic cells do not contain any membrane bound organelle. The organelles are present in the cytosol such as the ribosome which is the 70S ribosomes and the genetic material whereas the electron transport chain and complexes are embedded within the plasma membrane. So within the plasma membrane you have the electron transport chain uh, you will see the description about the electron transport chain when we are going to talk about the mitochondria. Apart from that uh, genomic material is present in the chromosome and as well as the extra chromosomal DNA. So prokaryotic cells contain the genetic material in the form of a circular DNA known as the bacterial chromosome. So but, but bacterial chromosome is different from the eukaryotic chromosome what is present in uh, the uh, eukaryotic cells. It contains the genetic elements for the replications, transcription and the translations. Bacterial chromosome follow a rolling circle model of the DNA replications. The genes present on the chromosome does not contain the non-coding region which is called as the introns and it is co-translated to the protein. Besides main circular DNA, bacteria also contain the extra chromosomal or extra circular DNA known as the plasmids. So what you see here is actually a plasmid. These plasmids are called as the extra chromosomal DNA uh, which means they are actually be uh, important for the bacteria but they are being present as a extra chromosomal DNA. Presence of plasmid containing resistant genes confer the resistance towards the known antibiotic Exchange of extra, extra chromosomal DNA between the different bacterial strain is one of the mechanism responsible for the spread of antibiotic resistance across the bacterial populations. So the plasmid is very important because the plasmid is the only genetic material which actually been exchanged between the different bacterial species and that is how they can be able to change the their properties with the neighboring residues right. For example, if you have if a bacteria has suppose 200 copies of a plasmid which is actually giving a conference uh, the resistance against the antibiotic for example antibiotic penicillin right then what it will do is it will actually going to give some of these plasmids to the under the bacteria which is actually sensitive bacteria so once it will these sensitive bacteria are actually going to receive these plasmids 
they will also going to be resistance resistant for the antibiotics uh, that's why uh, it is important that uh, when people are working in the laboratories or when people are working in a uh, biopharma industries or something these plasmids has to be the plasmid bearing bacteria which we, people are generating while they are doing the recombinant dna technology has to be destroyed very nicely so that the genetic pool of this plasmid should not go into the environment and that's how the if there will be an exchange of the uh, genetic material or exchange of the plasmid between the two bacteria it is actually going to spread the antibiotic resistance even in the natural bacteria and that's that is that is the one of the mechanism through which the bacteria are acquiring resistance and they acquire the resistance very fast because the uh, exchange of the plasmid material and that's why it is important to study about the plasmids we have the so plasmid is a circular dna and uh, there are different forms of plasmids what is present when you are going to uh, do the plasmids for the different types of treatment for example if you take the uh, in, so you have the bacterial plasmid is a double circular dna molecule and it exists in the three different forms if the both strands of the circular dna are intact it is called as the covalently circular dna so this is what you see here is a covalently circular dna whereas if one of the strand has nick then it is acquired the conformation of the open circular dna so if you are actually going to uh, put the nick in one of the strands like for example here then it is actually going to acquire another conformation which is called as the open circular dna or the oc form this is called as the triple c form this is called the oc form and the third is called as the supercoiled form during the isolation of the plasmid DNA from the bacteria covalently circular DNA loses few numbers of turn and as a result it acquires the supercoiled conformations. The interchange between these forms are possible under the in vitro or the in vivo conditions such as the DNA guidance produces the additional terms into the circular DNA to adopt the circular conformations. So bacteria plasmid is actually acquiring all these three conformations under the in vitro or the in vivo conditions and that is why they can be uh, you know they, that they, they, uh, they different enzymes are working. For example, if you take the circular DNA and if you put uh, the DNA gyrase, it is actually going to create the turns into this and that is how it will going to generate the supercoiled DNA. But if you take the supercoiled DNA and treat it with the topoisomerase, it is actually going to make, you know, reduce the turns and that is how the, it is going to be turned into the closed covalently closed circular DNA. Let us see one of the plasmids. These are the bacterial plasmids uh, which are uh, very commercially been available or very uh, been used in the recombinant DNA technologies. So plasmids are widely been used for the cloning of foreign DNA into the bacterial system as a host strain. Uh, and this is the plasmid which is uh, you know uh, which has the different types of components. One of the thing what you have here is uh, the the uh, the origin of replication so origin of replication is a place from where the the bacteria is actually going to start its replications then it also has the antibiotic resistance genes for example here you have you see it has the antibiotic resistance genes which is for the ampicillin so if this uh, bacteria if this plasmid will go to any bacteria it is actually going to give the Conf, uh, resistance against the ampicillin, the antibiotics. So the antibiotic resistance genes or the enzymatic gene is responsible for giving the phenotypic changes in the host after the entry of the plasmid. Apart from that, you what you see here is an enzyme which is also being present within the plasmids. And because the plasmid has the origin of replication, it has the antibiotic resistance and it has all these components, they are independent and that is how they are very, very uh, you know dangerous because they can be independent they do not be dependent on the nucleus for its replications or early active activities and that is why they can independently go to the new bacteria and the new bacteria is also going to have the additional features whatever is this plasmid is actually acquiring. 
let's see how you, we can be able to isolate the plasmid from the prokaryotic cell so pro, pro, the plasmid isolation is a multiple step process it is having the uh, many steps so in the step one what you have to do is you have to collect the bacteria so first you have to do is you have to take the bacteria you have to transform that bacteria with the plasmid or suppose the bacterial plasmid is present in the bacterial cell first thing is what you have to do is you have to grow these cells so that you have a sufficient number of bacteria then you have to do what you have to do is you have to in the step one you have to do a centrifugation and then you have to resuspend these bacterial cell in a solution one the solution one is actually containing the uh, 50 millimolar glucose, 25 millimolar trips SCL and 10 millimolar EDTA. So the method what we are discussing is called as the alkaline lysis method. In the step two, you are going to do the alkaline lysis. So in the step two, you are going to do the alkaline lysis that alkaline lysis you are going to do with the help of the 0.2 normal NaOH and 1% SDS and that is actually going to lyse the cells and it is going to denature the DNA. Ultimately you are going to do the third step which is called as the renaturation. So in the renaturation is going to be performed by the uh, potassium acetate solutions and the glacial, uh, glacial acetic acid solution and what will happen is that in this step the there will be the renaturation so that renaturation is actually going to renature the uh, plasmid dna but it will not renature the chromosomal dna and because of that the chromosomal dna is actually going to be discarded in the next step so when you are going to do the centrifugation the chromosomal dna since it is not been renatured it is going to be precipitate and it will going to be present in the form of pellet whereas the the supernatant is going to contain the uh, plasmid DNA. Then in the step protein, step 4, you are going to just do the purification of this plasmid. So you are going to do the deproteinations and that will result into the isolation of the plasmids. That deproteination you are going to do with the help of the chemical which is called as the phenoyl chloroform isomyl solutions and that is actually going to remove the protein so that you can be able to make the very highly quality, high, high purity uh, plasmid DNA. And uh, in the step 5 you are going to uh, uh, you are going to resuspend that plasmid into a alcohol from the solutions. So that is what you are, you are going to get in the, you, in the step 4 you are actually going to have the plasmid as well as the protein and then what you are going to do is protein will be present in the precipitate that supernatant you are going to collect and then that supernatant is going to, you are going to add the alcohol and once you add the alcohol the, uh, the, precipitate, the plasmid is going to be precipitate and that is how you are going to isolate the pure uh, plasmid. And that pure plasmid can be used for the uh, for the different types of applications like uh, different types of applications which we are not going to discuss. Uh, so let us uh, uh, me give you a very real experience how you can be able to isolate the plasmids from the bacterial cell. So I will take you to my lab where my student is actually going to show you a very small demo and how you can be able to isolate and the plasmids from the bacterial cell. Hello everyone, in this video we will show you how to isolate plasmid DNA using alkaline lysis method. For preparation of plasmid DNA, we need resuspension buffer, lysis buffer and neutralization buffer. In addition to that, we need isopropanol, RNAase and ethanol. Resuspension buffer contains 25 millimolar tris and 10 millimolar EDTA and we have to add RNAase at a final concentration of 100 microgram per ml. Lysis buffer contains 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide and 1% SDS. Neutralization buffer contains 3 molar potassium acetate, pH 6.0.
for isolation of plasmid DNA, we need at least overnight grown culture with OD of 3.0. So this is already a cultured one. We have to harvest the cells by centrifugation. These files we have to centrifuge 11,000 rpm for at least one minute to get the cells precipitated. Now we got the cell pellet. We can proceed for alkaline lysis method to isolate plasmid DNA. In first step, we are going to add resuspension buffer which contains RNAsa. mix thoroughly until all the cells suspended in resuspension solution. After the cells got suspended completely, now we have to lyse the cells using strong alkaline condition that is 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide and also 1% sodium dodehyl sulfide. Now we have to gently flip the tube in order to lyse the cells completely. We can keep in this condition for up to 5 minutes but not more than 5 minutes which will degrade the plasmid DNA and also genomic DNA will come out and it will interfere with the mini print. In next step, we have to neutralize the sodium hydroxide using neutralization buffer to prevent any further degradation. After adding neutralization buffer, you can see there is a white precipitate. That means all the proteins precipitated by neutralization buffer. You can flip the tube two three times completely precipitate all the remaining proteins. Now the solution contains solution part contains our plasmid DNA and the all the precipitated one contains genomic DNA and also the proteins from bacteria. Now we have to centrifuge this lysate for 10 minutes at 11,000 G. precipitate got settled. Now we have to transfer the white 
clear supernatant to another group. This clear supernatant contains plasmid DNA. Now we have to precipitate this plasmid DNA with the isopropanol followed by washing with the 70% ether. We can see white precipitate in the solution. Now we have to centrifuge it, collect the, the white precipitate and wash with the 70 percent. After precipitating plasmid DNA with the isopropanol, we will get a pellet of plasmid DNA. Now we have to wash that pellet. We wash this pellet with the seventy percent ethanol. Again, centrifuge the pellet. Now, we got the pellet. We have to air dry the pellet and dissolve it in deionized water or TE buffer. We will keep leave at room temperature till the ethanol got evaporated. Next, we will add the to easy the process of manual alkaline lysis method. There are several kits available from commercial vendors. The basic difference between alkaline lysis method and the kit based method is kit based method contains silica based columns where lysis lysate which containing plasmid DNA binds through these beads and after washing whatever the unwanted components are they will elute out and we will elute the plasmid DNA in TE buffer or water. The composition of the lysis buffer is same as previous uh, method and also neutralization buffer, precession buffer, every buffer contains same composition but in commercial kits we have one extra wash buffer which will remove any unwanted contamination and give pure DNA. So when you see this uh, demo, what you could see is that the students was discussing about the all the five, four or five steps what we have just discussed and after these steps what you are going to get, you are actually going to get the plasmid like this. So what you see here is the three forms of the plasmid. You have the co covalently closed circular DNA which means the triple C forms, you are going to have the OC forms and then you also going to have the supercoiled form. So what you see here is this is actually the closed circular, covalently closed circular DNA, this is the open circular DNA and this is the supercoiled DNA and whereas since we have not used the RNAs, you are also going to see the some amount of RNA because RNA is also present in the bacterial cell. 
So, uh, what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the bacterial prokaryotic cells. We have different. We have discussed about the structure of the prokaryotic cell. Uh, we have discussed about how the cell wall is. Uh, cell wall is thick in the case of the gram-positive bacteria, whereas it is thin in the case of the gram-negative bacteria. Apart from the cell wall, you also have the capsule and as well as the plasma membrane and all these barriers, anatomical barriers are making the bacterial cell very, very resistant for the environmental changes or the chemical what are present in the environments. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the eukaryotic cells. Thank you.